Hi, my name is Evan. I, um, I've been making comic books since 2006. Uh, it's uh, my career and it's the main thing I know how to do. <laughs> such to the to, to the extent that I do um, I've made several different comic books over the course of that period of the sort of um, you know epic fantasy variety uh, but in particular since 2010 that is over 10 years at this point I've been making um, one continuous fantasy adventure sort of pseudo-historical graphic novel called Batu. Uh, it's not the only thing I've done over that period, but that's been the through line of my work and the main self-directed thing I've done. This is uh, so much just what I do now <laughs> that I forget, I think, that it might be uh, interesting to somebody in the world, or it is at least unusual. Um, to make one big story in an entirely self-directed way for for so long and within a particular model of comic self-publishing that hadn't existed for very long before I came to it and which doesn't really exist in the same way now as it did when I started. So as I write this I'm on page 1140 something of this comic book or graphic novel if you like. Uh, I'm leaning into a protracted like climax and ending sequence that uh, that I hope I can execute upon uh, as well as I as well as I can see it in my head. Um, and the end of it is in sight, which is a weird feeling. So in this video, I'm going to go through some of my uh, process. Well, my entire process. I'm going to talk talk about it in pretty uh, pretty elaborate and um, exhausting detail. I think. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to talk about a lot of the stuff that this has made me think over the uh, years and years about what this type of storytelling is and uh, what is the world and the pop culture in which I'm releasing it and, uh, and what has become of that world. Um, maybe that interests you. Here we go. Just love those long, rainy afternoons. In 2006, inconceivably long ago, I was uh, 18. I was in college in North Carolina. I had been drawing forever. I started drawing and posting online this comic, Rice Boy, a partially improvised, sometimes very rough, sort of psychedelic pastiche of a high fantasy adventure story. I think doing that at that moment just by luck is why I was able to make this a career. I think that's a huge part of it. I think that's a bigger and bigger part of it the more I think about it. I think that was the moment to try to make something like that and to build an audience online by making it available for free. Rice Boy wasn't unprecedented in any way at all really, but there wasn't anything like it being published in that space at that time uh, that I was aware of or or am aware of now. If I tried to go through some more traditional publishing angle that comic with that comic, that is if I hadn't put it online for free, I would not have a career in this medium. Um, full stop. So over the next few years, I self-published Rice Boy in print. I started another one with a more grounded, sort of faux mythological vibe called Order of Tales. Self-published that in print, etc. Started going to comic conventions, met real people who make this stuff, who care about it and understand it. Really beautiful feeling. Uh, vibrant world of individuals making idiosyncratic work and building lives around that work in a publishing framework that was new that felt really sometimes miraculous. That's grandiose and ridiculous to say, but that is how it felt to me um, as a person in that time and as a young person, you know. In 2010, Order of Tales was done and I was pretty far into planning the next big comic I would make. This was the same year, no, this was a year after uh, my graduating college with a degree in Spanish. 
with which I do very little other than occasionally give people directions. Here were my starting points for the thing that became Vatu. First, I wanted to continue with the approach to a fantasy setting that I developed. A bunch of strange, non-human character shapes, an invented setting with no top-down explanation of how it works. This was nominally going to be set in the same fictional world as uh, the previous books I'd done. The non-human character thing sprung out of a frustration with visual fantasy media when I was starting Rice Boy. Like, why not make up how everything looks from scratch if you're going to be drawing an entire book? Even now, it's wild to me how rarely people try to do something like this. I don't think it's an incredible innovation or anything, and it's certainly not unprecedented. But you'd think more people would be interested in working with non-human characters. I don't know, this is a, I guess, a lifelong fixation of mine. Um, another starting point. Uh, I was frustrated at the frantic, airy pace of the comics I'd so far made. I wanted to make something that felt rich and huge, like a prose novel can feel to me. But it has turned out to be difficult to do anything like that, in my estimation, while maintaining the sort of narrative voice that I wanted in comics. That is a uh, very visual, very diegetic very focused on rhythm and paced out dialogue, something like that. In retrospect, the way I saw towards getting better at comics, not objectively better, but better according to, I don't know, my understanding of the medium, uh, was at odds with the possibility of making something that felt as huge and rich as I wanted to make a story feel. So my solution at age 22, in, in 2010, to this problem uh, was to just make something bigger, just make a comic with more comic in it, more panels. This thing will be over a thousand pages, I thought. It'll take like five years, I thought. This comic was going to be about this isolated, isolated little culture of creatures with marks on their big foreheads and it would be built around a moment of contact with a big Roman Empire type civilization. But then it could be a bigger thing about one figure from that isolated culture moving through the Empire taking on all these different roles a big pseudo-historical ascendant arc to tie the whole story to in the way Rice Boy and Order of Tales were tied to the heroic journey thing. But then there could be all these other peoples in the Empire, these other things happening that would collide with Vatu herself, make her trajectory a part of a bigger historical trajectory. Something like that is, uh, is about as far as I got <laughs> before starting the thing. I started filling up these red spiral bound notebooks working this out. I started doing this before I drew the first finished page of Vatu and I continued it throughout. I am still continuing it. I filled 11 of these, mostly writing and some visual development. The vast majority of development was in these notebooks. The broad plot crystallized early, but there's a lot of moving parts for me. Like, it really feels like the most complicated thing I could wrap my head around uh, at all. So I was working constantly through outlines, making everything fit, rehearsing and re-rehearsing in text on paper what would happen until the feeling was of a huge, mostly solid, mostly memorized structure. Importantly, I think it never was solid. Uh, this was never a question of just... Uh, referring to the outline and filling it in according to the plan I'd made years ago. Things were always changing. Big picture writing was always an active process aside from certain points. I've never felt like I had an automatic understanding of how a story should work. I feel like there are basic things other people pick up on that I don't. So uh, I try to think of that as an asset in my head. Like a way of doing things that are a little unpredictable or unsettling sometimes. Who knows? Yeah. 
So there's uh, big picture writing and structural stuff like all that, and then there's translating that into what's happening moment to moment in a scene. Vatu has turned out to be extremely about dialogue. Like it feels like a stage play a lot of the time. And the engine of the story to me feels like conversations, characters bumping into each other. The visual aspect supports and contextualizes this and is essential, but it's usually not the starting point, at least in the later parts of the story, when most of the visual stuff has a lot of uh, precedent already worked out. I never had scenes tightly worked out very far in advance, but usually the broad stuff that has to happen in a given scene was clear to me years before I got to the scene. Not by virtue of me being thorough at planning, but just because of how long it takes to make the final pages happen. So I'd take these uh, practical requirements and write around them, build up what would happen or what the interactions in a given scene would be like, uh, a lot of loose scrapped dialogue to like get in character, like to figure out the voices and what tensions exist in the scene to play with, to build some potential energy into what's happening. Usually I'd end up with a written script, uh, but this is of course a visual medium, so all writing is, in my take <laughs> on the medium is, uh, is subordinate to the visual. The rhythm on a page, what can be fit in a panel, etc. Often longer chunks of indulgent dialogue have to be broken up or edited down because I think of the image as reflecting just one moment or one mood of dialogue. Uh, this is called thumbnailing in the industry, breaking down pages into quick, loose maps or diagrams. These, these are all uh, ongoing rolling processes. The big picture development, the scene writing, the thumbnailing. Okay, I'm going to talk through in pretty granular detail now my approach for drawing the pages of the book. Um, a lot of, most of my process is functionally the same uh, as it was uh, when I did Rice Boy in 2006 to 2008, um, but it's been refined in elements, I guess. Um, and uh, the way I draw the book is subject to the structure of online publishing as I've come to it. That is, no matter how much big picture planning I do, I'm, uh, I'm always drawing the pages one at a time, and I'm usually entirely finishing one page before I start on the next. Uh, planning enough so that hopefully I don't run into significant continuity issues uh, as a side effect of that approach. I've done books for publishers where I've had to interface directly with editors and which therefore have demanded a less incremental process. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with both of these sorts of processes um, and I haven't, I really haven't arrived at categorically preferring one over the other. I don't think this is a, uh, for me, this isn't a find which one you prefer type of thing. Both have strengths and weaknesses that I've run into at great length. Uh, and the stories that emerge out of both of these processes are necessarily different because of how they're approached. An incrementally drawn story basically demands improvisation, demands shifting away from and recontextualizing your initial goals in ways a more systematic approach does not. Um, but the trick, I think, um, like any sort of medium limitation, is just to be aware of what the limitations are and um, tailor your approach so that so that they're assets <laughs> something like that that's the ideal at least pages of Vatu are drawn in physical media 
at 10 by 15 inches. That is around 180% of the reproduction size for the printed books. This is a larger percentage than most other comics I've drawn, and definitely larger than it has to be, but things look tighter the higher that percentage is, and I'm still sticking with that scale for, that scale for consistency's sake, I guess. I pencil pages fairly loosely in extremely hard, almost invisible pencil. Uh, I, ink with a, I ink with a brush, which demands a sort of improvisatory drawing style, so there's a kind of push and pull between how tight the pencils are and how much the inks become their own thing. Pencils are about composition first and foremost, making sure images are intelligible. Intelligibility is the most important thing as these aren't illustrations. The drawings in a comic don't illustrate the narrative, they are the narrative. And even if you treat them as illustrating the narrative, they'll be read as being the narrative because that's how we read comics. Vatu is told in a very, I guess, uptight, uh, literalistic visual style. I try to push everything towards expression of what's real in the world of the story, like these are objective images of what's objectively happening. Of course, there's still style to it because there can't not be, but I've gotten so deep into this particular, I guess, sort of cinematic approach that I'm not really aware of what I'm doing stylistically. So I'm constantly cross-referencing what I'm drawing with previous appearances of whatever it is in the comic. It's not perfectly contiguous and it seems silly to aim for that, but the appearance of objectivity and consistency is important to me. Panel borders and speech bubbles, the sort of separate non-diegetic drawing elements, are all in micron pen. The material of the images themselves are inked in brush. I used, I used a real sable hair brush for the first several hundred pages, I think. A uh, huge learning curve that I'd navigated a lot of in working through Rice Boy and Order of Tales uh, for that sort of tool. Now I use a Pentel pocket brush that I just dip in ink. It's a neat, snappy, synthetic hair brush that can do everything I need it to do. Brushes are kind of the platonic ideal drawing tool, I think. There's limitations and they require a lot more specificity and control than other types of tools, but a brush can do basically every type of drawing I want to do. And there's that improvisatory quality. You can't totally control the thing, or I can't, uh, and the quality of the lines in a pencil underdrawing is extremely different from what a brush does. So final ink lines are sometimes shaky, inconsistent, or whatever, but they're alive looking, they're handmade looking, and the dimension that is added by them, even if imperfectly, is worth it to me. I think about this a lot with character expressions in particular. There's a lot of acting in this. In drawing characters in a narrative, you're acting through them. Some of that acting takes place in the planning, some of it is in the pencil underdrawing, and using an inking tool that demands drawing quickly and improvising really pushes the acting feel, I think. Not just, uh, not just my experience of drawing expressions, but I think the reader experience too. It pushes me to make very particular little acting decisions that I wouldn't have foreseen outside of the process itself. I think this acting thing is uh, kind of more more an essential, more of an essential component of comics than most people seem to acknowledge, though maybe it falls under the umbrella of how most people use the word cartooning. Physical drawing like this hasn't been the industry standard thing for comics and illustration for a while, I think. There are many very good reasons to draw entirely digitally. I have tried to be objective with myself about this. Part of me does have some mystical attachment to traditional media, to the feeling of handmadeness and physicality that I think of it as providing. Uh, I don't want to just be doing this this way for snobbish or backwards reasons though. But this is where my skills are. Uh, this is 10 times easier for me than drawing on a tablet has ever been. Uh, and it does add certain things, I think, things which are 
outside of those stupid mystical ideas about physical media being inherently more real or superior. Um, also, I look at a screen for enough of the process, and uh, I don't want to be looking at one for the entire process. I scan pages using an 8.5 by 11 scanner, uh, the same scanner I've been using since before I started Rice Boy. How does that work? No digital technology I've ever had has worked so perfectly for so long. Incredible. There's some busy work in stitching together pages, but it's probably just five minutes or so. Uh, I flatten everything out in Photoshop to pure black and white at 600 DPI, so it's easier to work with. My parents were graphic designers when I was a kid. I grew up with a lot of uh, osmosis knowledge about print production. And thank God I went in, into comics with an understanding that you need high resolutions for reproduction, much higher than you need for screen display. This is probably more generally understood by now, but it wasn't uh, how a lot of people were saving their art around when I started out. Uh, I go through and clean up the line work. I use a little Wacom tablet for this, also fairly old, uh, very cheap, I think discontinued. It's a bamboo. Um, I only got it around 100 or so pages into Vatu, and it's unthinkable that I did any cleanup or coloring before without it. Um, cleaning up line work is tedious, and I try not to get sucked into doing everything perfectly. Uh, the goal is clarity, nothing too wobbly or inconsistent, um, but as much preservation of that improvisatory ink vibe as possible. For colors, uh, I build the colors around two basic layers in a, pro in a process that I, uh, I really have not fundamentally changed since 2006. Uh, I think a lot of this is kind of industry standard, but I don't, I don't really know. Uh, and I don't know a lot of the lingo uh, that is used in the industry to talk about coloring. Um, I feel like I don't understand color as intuitively as the drawing part of this process. And coloring for me is a lot of stacking things on top of each other and seeing if it looks right. Coloring digitally is forgiving for this sort of thing. And it's so uh, astronomically simpler and quicker than any sort of traditional media coloring that it doesn't make uh, any sense at all for me to do it any other way if I'm going to do something in color. Uh, the first phase is called flats in the industry. Um, just filling in big flat areas of local color. Uh, that is the quote unquote objective color of everything in the scene. The color of everything under white light, maybe. This is uh, also tedious and usually doesn't involve a lot of real decision making for me. After flats, I put a layer set to multiply on top, and this is the lighting or the atmospheric layer. Single big flat multiplied color on top of flats will help bring everything together, make it look like it's existing in the same place. Uh, I go through and set up everything with its own little light and shadow portions cell shaded uh, I guess like in a traditional animation everything is a hard border in most of the comics that I draw um, no blurs or gradients I like the cleanness of this I like working with its limitations um, part of that is because I think 90s high budget anime looks uh, about as cool as I can imagine drawings looking generally this lighting layer is built around one light and one shadow color. These aren't just different in value, but at least a little different in color too. The light will be a little bit yellower or a little bit redder or whatever than the shadow. This is kind of received knowledge, I think. Everybody talks about doing this. It's a principle that's pretty well established even way back in oil painting days. Uh, and that's because it looks richer and less flat, which generally is what I'm aiming for. On top of that, I'll mess around with various little lighting detail layers, like a layer for little shiny details, or a layer to push an area of the drawing towards the color of the sky for an approximation of atmospheric perspective. Sometimes I change the color of bits of line work for various reasons, 
You get the idea. Uh, a lot of this has shifted a bit through Vatu, uh, and when I've worked on other projects, I've been open to shifting it further a little bit more. But generally, it's the same all the way through. Uh, I, I am certainly too uptight with this process. It's not extremely flexible. Um, but uh, I guess, as I said, uh, every way of working has limitations, so why not just um, be aware of them and, and try to bend them to your will. <laughs> As pages are finished, I put them up on my website, uh, rice-boy.com, where I've been putting all these comics since sometime in 2006. It's still there. It's still structurally about the same as it's always been. Uh, I've enjoyed hanging on to this little lightweight lo-fi space on the internet as everything around it has dramatically changed. Uh, a lot has changed. Um, I guess I'm going to talk about some of that now. Uh, I moved to Brooklyn, New York from North Carolina in 2010, very early in working on Vatu, to live with some lovely and brilliant people I knew through the independent comics scene. Before moving, I was in a drifting sort of moment out of college for not that long, really drilling into work in comics in a way that I was telling myself would be uh, materially sustainable, uh, but I didn't know how sustainable, and I still don't. <laughs> um, there's always been an intense excitement, optimism, uh, forward momentum feeling about working on big projects like this for me. But it is also kind of depressive work. Just the, the substance of the work is staring at paper and a computer screen, um, working on the thing that's mostly in your head, working on it uh, alone. But... Um, Starting to meet people at comic conventions around around that time, 20, 2009, 2010, uh, and moving to New York felt like an entirely new world. It felt like a um, a real intense human dimension to this this work uh, was all of a sudden there. Over the next few years, I became very connected to what, at the time, you could still define discreetly as the web comics scene. It felt like an extremely new, um, uncompromising space. It was hugely exciting to meet all these people doing work independently and making careers of it. There was a period of a few years where several other people I knew in independent comics moved into the same area that I lived in. We were, um, it felt like bouncing off of each other's excitement uh, about what we were working on. It felt like kind of a, an ascendant moment, uh, an ascendant world to be making independent art in. The shift away from that feeling for me is maybe about getting older and maybe about drifting into other spaces, drifting out of those spaces. Uh, it is definitely in large part because of uh, what has happened to the internet. When I started publishing a webcomic on my own little website and building my own little thing outside of traditional publishing infrastructures, that was a broadly uh, imaginable thing to do. Of course, there were still a lot of traditionalist holdouts who, who only saw legitimacy as getting in with a publisher. You're only doing, co you're only doing comics really to them if, you're, uh, if somebody else is paying to get them physically produced and paying you what are in this country usually meager royalties. It was fun to see the open contempt from those sectors of the industry sometimes, but generally uh, it was an imaginable thing to do to publish your own thing on the internet. It was an era where people had independent websites and a huge amount of the internet and what people did on it was independent websites. So it was uh, thinkable to do your own thing in that window of time in which I started Rice Boy. But over the course of the following 15 years, everything clamped up in these walled garden corporate social mediums. And now it kind of feels like we're back in that place where we can't imagine working outside of spaces and logics of authority and outside of appealing to those corporate structures, uh, their, their algorithms, their tastes, whatever. 
uh, I'm not faulting anybody now for not starting out how I happen to start out. First of all, it's harder to imagine doing that, but also it is not possible, I don't think, to start out that way. People don't, after all, go to websites anymore. The spaces individuals, individual artists carve out on corporate platforms can be good and useful and have a lot of potential energy in them, but they're deeply compromised and unstable in ways that I don't think we're always aware of. I fully think that I got lucky starting out in a context in which my sort of thing was a feasible thing, and I've held on to an increasingly outdated looking model of independent publishing since then. Also, of course, I feel like I'm radically drifting out of touch with where it's at, what independent publishing now looks like, what the experiences of creators building massive audiences on Webtoon, for example, are like. It's hard to separate how much of my uh, quote-unquote analysis of all this is just getting old type shit. Also, I should say, I haven't done all this as a total independent agent. Uh, and my work as an independent artist has allowed me to buy in to various corporate structures throughout this whole period. So, so I don't mean to uh, mythologize this shit. Uh, I don't mean to say that this is a profound revolutionary act and that the best art is made by lone, uncompromising geniuses. Compromise is always there. Comics are emphatically about craft to me not about uncompromising genius. Comics have spent uh, a lot of their history as a commercial medium, and their structure and aesthetics proceed from that history, proceed from that compromise. Compromise is more deeply baked into comics than most media, I think. Um, I just think it's instructive to look at the trajectory of independent work within that medium, particularly as this is mostly ephemeral stuff that gets forgotten or mythologized or ignored. The vast majority of this comic deals with a single bounded setting, which is a city called Sata, the capital of an empire of the same name. Its emergence into the story is a big shocking moment that uh, I think I mean to recontextualize the whole story. Like there's no indication at the start that this comic about... Um, a, a small, isolated culture is going to be mostly about social dynamics within an ancient Rome type of city. Making the city is a single big project on its own. A lot of the development for this comic has been to um, effectively build it according to the, to the needs of the story and to work at it enough that it could come across as a consistent place. To start with, I wanted the key things about it to be clearly communicated through the images of the story itself, um, with no reliance on a map or other sort of extra textual conceits. Uh, I've made various maps and things like that, but the thing is in the story, and I think I've uh, failed in a way if you need to look at a map to figure out the necessary parts or if the story depends on your uh, orientation to that, to that extent. To this end, um, I was aiming really hard at consistency on making a fictional place where you'd really recognize one part of it from a few hundred pages ago, where you'd know, um, where you'd know broadly where the key locations were. So sometime in 2010, I started building a simple 3D model in the, uh, I think now, defunct SketchUp program uh, to use as reference. This is a pretty enormous thing, and the adherence of 
the comic to it isn't exact, but it's helped keep everything straight. Hundreds of panels of the comic are directly referenced from shots of this 3D model. The city, I think it's important to deeply realize, uh, is not a real thing. It's not a real place. It's a, a literary tool. The appearance of its reality is an aspect of that tool and, uh, and its usefulness to me. Um, and a lot of work goes into the maintenance of that appearance of, the, of reality, maybe not enough. Uh, but everything is in service of the story itself, um, is, is, is my approach. Uh, that's my ideal for this sort of thing, at least. Um, but, uh, you know, personally, I find vibe more involving than, like, technical, uh, like, literal plausibility. What the story is about has to inform the setting, or else why build a setting, I think. Um, so, for example, this is the capital of an empire in a story broadly about power and identity. So naturally there's a big tower that you can see from everywhere, and that's where the emperor lives. The tower is at the highest point. It's at the fork in the river that defines the shape of the whole place. Naturally, there's a single main road that goes through the middle of the city, and this is a basic organizing principle throughout the city all the time. Where are you in relation to this road and this big tower, which is where authority is? There's a lot of aspects like this where um, plausibility or like historical realism or whatever uh, are kind of sacrificed in the service of just emphasizing what I want the city to accomplish in the story. Um, I think I didn't fully understand what a theme was in storytelling until a ways into Vatu. Uh, and it's been fun to go super heavy-handed with it. Figuring out what subtext you can draw out and string together, seeing what motifs you can tie to the story's big ideas and just have them show up at significant moments. I love it. Being mindful of the balance between story and world building has been essential to me in working with this. For example, uh, let's talk about the religion practiced by this empire. I started thinking about it as pure world building, like uh, wouldn't it be interesting if this was a real religion type of thinking. Um, so I built this structure around six different aspects of uh, the one god that these people worship, who's a sort of a stand-in for a like um, conquering monotheistic you know, a rationale for a, for a, for a conquering empire. Um, but then the story was fixating more and more, kind of outside of my control, it feels like, on this, uh, this question of identity, on how you make yourself and your world makes you. Um, so a single god with six aspects becomes a way of talking about exactly that. Are you one god? Are you totally accountable for your component parts? What does it mean if you inherit a version of yourself that's not you? Stuff like that. It's uh, hard to nail down too specifically, but that kind of back and forth feels really important to me for this book. Sata is defined by a few separate environments that the story eventually focuses on one by one. I wanted these to be visible from different vantage points throughout the story, and I wanted them to be visually distinct. Uh, I remember thinking a lot about World of Warcraft when I started on this. I never played very much of that game, but the, the feeling of distinct, like, color-coded environments um, within a city really stuck with me. Uh, and, and for all this talk about making a setting from scratch, I, uh, of course, didn't do that really, and nobody ever can. We're always working with the context we start with and working with the assumptions we assume readers will make. It's a big imperial city, so I developed the look of all of it out of the way ancient Rome looked. I did a lot of uh, abstract visual research and landed on a pretty limited set of visual premises, blocky wood and stucco, tile roofs, and intense, uh, constant focus on square shapes and enclosures. That's the baseline aesthetic, but then there's different um, like sub-environments within the city that are kind of consistent with it, 
um, but are designed in opposition to it and to emphasize what I'm trying to say about those environments. The Surin enclave is closed off. It's more elegant and sentimental, rounder, and obviously the color scheme is distinct. Uh, Grachette is shadowed, muddy, uh, made with much more organic looking materials. And the, the uh, Emperor's Palace is, the Emperor's Palace complex is monumental, brighter and more austere and intense in its design. a lot of my approach to making the setting for this book world building is the buzzword and I feel like uh, I don't know it's such a flashy and exciting process that I that it's a lot of people's starting point for making um, you know fantasy or genre stories in general I think and uh, because I've been making stories set in a conspicuously invented world for so long it's become a big part of like how I talk about what I'm doing uh, and how people talk to me about it but I, uh, I want to emphasize that it's basically I think a two-part process and all of the background work that you make building an interesting or resident or plausible setting is probably the less important part the other part is conveying that or what's pertinent of it to a, to a reader this is basically just the show don't tell principle applied in a magnified specified uh, broader way and that principle is not a totally applicable rule of course and there's always reasons to break it but the uh, particular aesthetic I have for this thing is about prioritizing showing over telling. I should stop. Uh, I should stop adding that caveat about this is just my preference. But um, I, I, I want to continue to make it clear that I have no insight to how this stuff is done, just uh, the way that I am doing it. So. Uh, so what good is a big, well-defined city space if the story doesn't care about it and if the characters don't engage with it? What good are elaborate, invented cultural ideas if we have to put the story aside in order to explain them? I'm trying to make a coherent, involving story, not, not a setting. The setting is a device for the telling of that story. And at the same time, I'd like that device to seem to exist beyond the margins of the story. But, uh, but it all does come down to the story, which means it all comes down to the characters and their experience of the world. People living in a world don't have their whole cosmology objectively explained to them, really. People living in a world believe things about that world so deeply that they don't feel the need to articulate them out loud. These things, uh, supposed facts or whatever, about the world arrive to us through the, uh, through the medium of the social and the political. So a central challenge to me in this genre is to explain in a covert way to the reader how a setting works while never deviating at all from the characters and the ways in which they experience the world. This yields, I think, some periods of disorientation for a reader, which uh, I'm comfortable with because I kind of like those periods of disorientation uh, when I'm reading secondary world stuff. Um, 
I like being induced to trust that a world makes sense and that characters believe in it and that a story will move forward indifferent to my understanding of its setting. Uh, it can feel like that, but on the back end, the story really isn't indifferent. A lot of effort is being made by a writer to teach you, not just to explain to you, how the setting works through, uh, through the medium of the story and characters. And as a reader, I think you'll learn how it works more deeply and automatically if it's taught to you in this way. There is, uh, there is nothing worse to me than the dramatic voiceover over a black screen at the start of a fantasy movie explaining the cosmology of a setting and its ancient history. Um, generally, this strikes me as uh, unforgivably lazy and uh, like unconfident. It always uh, goes in one ear and out the other. I think these big picture elements of a setting, I mean, if these big picture elements of a setting are important, uh, you should have the faith in your story to demonstrate their importance through the medium of the story. Uh, you could say maybe that Vatu has a similarly disconnected little intro voiceover on the first page. Um, my defense of that would be that I'm using that mostly for tone and a vague sense of historical contextualization, not the revelation of any important world details to be held onto by the reader. The sense of historical contextualization, not actual historical contextualization that's, uh, that's relevant. So that's the city. There's this city that is where the story mostly takes place. And it's the big focal point of the setting. And it's um, literally where just a lot of it is. But, but uh, Vatu is also nominally set in the same invented world as Rice Boy and Order of Tales a setting full of different non-human creatures called Overside. Rice Boy and Order of Tales are both pretty densely interrelated. Uh, they touch on the same history. A few of the same characters show up, show up in each of them. But as I was working through Order of Tales, the second of the two, I really tried to emphasize the needs of that story over the continuity between the two. But that continuity between the two does still exist. Uh, and as a result of my treatment of that, I, I, I think Order of Tales doesn't stand as well as its own story. Characters show up and you're kind of expected to know their significance because you saw them previously in Rice Boy. Um, this is what I imagine the experience of reading the comic is like anyway, although I've heard from a lot of people that have read Order of Tales first uh, and seem to uh, like it all right, so um, who knows? <laughs> Uh, it was my belief in 2010 when I started Vatu, and uh, and it still basically is that um, prioritization of uh, interstory continuity or hereafter uh, meta continuity over the needs of an individual story tends to make the individual stories themselves weaker. This is a just a big, broad snobby opinion I have, and I don't know how much better than that I could uh, defend it, honestly. Um, you may disagree, and maybe you're right. I think, uh, I think a lot of it is kind of a taste issue. But <clears throat> I tried to approach Vatu from the start, mindful of all this, as much as I could be at the time. Um, it was the same setting, uh, yes, 
but uh, I sort of set it up so that that didn't amount to very much. It's uh, it's so far in the world internal past, and its concerned concerns are so focused around this one empire and what's going on in it that the uh, the pressure of the rest of the known fictional world didn't much compromise my thinking going into Vatu. As I've worked on other stuff over the past 10 odd years, I've thought a lot about what it means to do the thing of inventing a fictional world, what an invented world is as a device. Um, I love working with invented settings and I will continue to um, forever. <laughs> I think it's a really incredible bit of uh, literary technology to have a story set in a place that's apparently fully consistent and unfamiliar, being dropped into it as a reader and figuring out how it works. And um, I think of it as a technology because it really is a huge, like, generational technical effort. It took a building of literacy among readers and writers over the course of decades for us to get to the point now where we can really drill into this idea, really make interesting, strange worlds, and depend on readers to accept them and to understand stories in them. Uh, I love this. But um, an individual story has its own ideas and needs, so it can feel limiting to have the tool of the invented setting at your disposal, but to have the uh, employment of that tool limited by different premises or genre conventions or other stories that you're supposed to treat as taking place in the same setting. I, uh, I started VATU in 2010, as I've said a hundred times, uh, and obviously complicated metacontinuity has been a part of genre fiction for a long time. It's been a part of invented world fantasy forever. Uh, though the approach to it that, that really got nailed down in the, uh, in the modern way, probably in the middle 20th century, the literalistic or journalistic way where we're meant to see the invented setting as a thing conveyed objectively through the text as opposed to a purely um, poetic or allegorical device. It's been a part of comics, obviously, in a really clear and sometimes ridiculous way with uh, monthly serialized books all sharing the same setting, um, spending huge amounts of time tying things together for often no other reason than, I imagine, the satisfaction of viewing a theoretically bounded, interconnected structure uh, immersion or whatever. I think this is what people talk about a lot of the time when they talk about immersion. Um, but think also about this, uh, this moment in more mainstream pop culture. Marvel's uh, Iron Man movie came out in 2008 and wrapped up in that movie even before the wider cinematic universe of which it is a part was this, this promise of a dense interconnected metacontinuity. Characters would bounce between stories. Each thing would feed into each new thing in complicated and uh, exciting or at least compulsively nerd-satisfying ways. This promise has, I think, clearly been fulfilled with those movies. Um, say what you will about that project, but it certainly has made a metacontinuity um, as dense as you could want from the, the type of media that they are. It certainly is uh, an unprecedented thing to be attempted in that space and in that way. And it seems like the biggest step ever made in the normalization of that sort of nerd maximalism. Now that everyone has seen those movies, it's a lot easier to expect dense interstory continuity and a rigid canon and a uh, supposedly objective authorial voice conveying things journalistically exactly as they happen in, the, in an invented world. Um, the, the, the supposed objectivity of that voice being sort of uh, augmented by, by uh, its shared perspective across a number of different connected stories in, in metacontinuity. Um, forgive me for getting abstract. Past a certain point, um, 
I do find this kind of deadening. Genre fiction, I think, is inherently about literalizing, about uh, nailing down and objectifying poetic ideas like uh, ghosts, other worlds, or the future, or whatever. But to me, the ideal that I'm more and more overtly trying to go for is to balance that literalism with something, to make a fantasy story that works within the received standards of the genre, that is a supposed objective point of view, a supposed consistent world that's understood to exist outside the bounds of the story, but is, uh, is driven by its own needs and its own interests outside of that technical structure. So, um, uh, to sort of summarize that, I guess, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that we're never really world building. We're constructing a tool in service of a story and in service of, you know, the ideas that are central to that story, whether we're aware of them or not. It seems important not to lose sight of the idea that we're always making some positive statement, no matter what, even when we think we're being objective, or especially then. I uh, keep waiting for a bigger backlash against the corporate internet. <laughs> For people to get excited broadly and like reflexively about independent online spaces and about independent work by virtue of its independence. But over the course of this period I'm talking about, it feels also like the technique of corporate media has uh, perfected itself in a way, has laid down more clearly than ever the premises for what good polished art and storytelling are, and has just cranked up all the available knobs to make the most good, the most polished uh, art and storytelling ever, according to its own premises. And uh, independent artists, we're making work in the same world in which those aesthetics exist. So we're induced in ways we aren't even aware of to make something that appeals to the same slick, low-risk aesthetic as big-budget movies, TV, video games, whatever. And while this isn't a bad aesthetic, it doesn't seem like that's where the appeal of art made by individuals compromising as little as possible uh, should be. It, uh, it feels like it's gotten harder for individuals to make a living doing art lately outside of buying into corporate structures. Uh, of course, I only have my own weird contingent uh, perspective on this, and I have been you know, sometimes struggling to to make a living doing it. Um, and I don't mean to valorize making a living doing art uh, in particular, but I think it's a signif signifier of the trend uh, and a signifier of how independent art is uh, fitting into the world bounded as it is by the profit motive. Hasn't everything gotten more precarious and paranoid and shut off. Isn't the world just clearly more antisocial and desperate than it was 10 or so years ago? Isn't being a person different than it used to be? In trying to keep myself afloat in a material way, I've done that buying in too over the past several years. And I've been fortunate to be able to do that mostly in ways that I'm happy with and with institutions that I trust and that believe in the work that I'm doing. Uh, I just finished a trilogy of middle grade fantasy graphic novels called Island Book with first, second books. Totally new experience for me. Um, it was consistently a pleasure to work with people who understand what comics can do and are supportive of the um, particular thing I wanted to make. I feel like that's kind of a new kind of a new thing in American graphic novel publishing. And uh, I'm right now working on my, my second graphic novel uh, with Iron Circus Comics run by Spike Trotman, who is uh, one of the people in comics who I've known the longest. Um, 
and whose like taste and and vision I would basically trust my life with. Uh, and also for the past several years I've been working with Topatico. Uh, they handle merchandise and shipping and stuff. Uh, practically every physical thing that I make. Topatico was started in a long ago internet by Jeffrey Rowland, another uh, fellow traveler in the web comics world. Uh, and there's nothing like it. I love them. There's those sorts of buying in, and I don't mean to disparage them by calling it that, uh, uh, but then there's broader, more cultural buying into what the internet is now that uh, I feel more ambivalent about. And I think a lot of other people do too. Um, social media is a lot of what the internet is now, as you know. Uh, I think it's it's really all the internet is to a lot of people. The trajectory since 2009 or so feels pretty clear from here. More and more of us live on these platforms, and these platforms are increasingly invested in closing off spaces outside of their boundaries, uh, walled gardens, right? They keep buying each other and uh, algorithmically limiting our agency within them while always pushing this rhetoric of free and human engagement. Uh, Twitter doesn't like you to link to other websites. It certainly doesn't like you to mention any words that indicate you're trying to sell something or establish yourself as an artist um, or an individual existing anywhere but Twitter. And these platforms have all done the Faustian venture capital thing. So they're required to increase their profitability, uh, which ends up meaning systematically destroying whatever was initially appealing or useful about themselves in order to maximize potential ad revenue or to uh, to sort of use buzzwords to give the impression to shareholders that that it'll become more profitable. And now there's no functional alternative. It seems like like where else would we go? How could you let people know about what you're making outside of social media? This isn't anything that hasn't been said a million times before, of course. Oh, and now there's fucking crypto. Um, let's see how that plays out. I'm still, I'm still doing my research. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open mind. I'm trying to determine if it's exactly the nihilistic death cult uh, that it seems to be. I um uh, I was a pretty early adopter of Twitter and I've used it consistently in a uh, uh usually arm's length self-promotional capacity. It sucks you in though. It compels you to operate the way it wants you to operate. And my attitude of kind of performing a professionalized character of myself of not ever fully being there, of not ever talking about uh, my life <clears throat> is feeling more and more like some outmoded or like fetishistic attempt at privacy. Um, I don't think that's what it, I don't think that I'm particularly private, but I'm on the internet as a person who makes art. Mostly I'm talking here in these spaces as if I could be talking to anybody, uh, even, people I don't personally know. Uh, I'm not really here as myself m in most spaces. Uh, another area that's hugely shifted is the way we think about politics in public. A lot of people, myself included, have been sort of uh, uh, crystallizing their political perspectives over the past several years in a way that didn't seem to be broadly on the table in years before. The easy or liberal, if you like, uh, angle on this trend is to talk in terms of tribalism, but I don't think that's what it is really. 
these uh, these huge, clear, narrativizable political things are keep happening. And at the same time, we're all communicating in an absurdly high context way about them. And a lot of our communication is taking place on these uh, these frantic conflict incentivizing platforms. And we're all we've all obfuscated the conflict incentivizing aspect of those platforms. In art and storytelling, the relevant area is this critical theory thing. Critical theory is, if I understand it right, a framework for talking about the ideological subtexts of things in culture, a way of interrogating art, for example, to see how it expresses the politics it grows out of. Like a lot of um, potentially liberatory analytical tools, the this framework has percolated down to us here in the mass culture in a kind of low resolution and often legislative way. I hope it is not too controversial for me to say. Um, a lot of the time we use the tool of critical theory not to hear what is being said or to understand, you know, different invisible dimensions of our culture, um, but to determine what art is saying the right thing and to think that we as artists can engineer uh, politi politically flawless work where we are totally in command of, um, of every layer of subtext. I don't think that's possible, but I kind of act as if it is. Uh, I think a lot of people do. <laughs> And as this has become a huge part of how media is talked about, uh, I think I've learned a lot. Uh, a bunch of the decisions I started Vatu with because they seemed cool or interesting started to seem to have a lot of invisible political weight to them. And the story itself sort of became a way of working through its own political content. This became a, a new layer of, of writing the thing to me. Not necessarily making a big political argument of the story, although there's aspects of that. Um, but just trying to be aware of what's happening ideologically in a story about a person abducted by a conquering empire. Uh, I'm a white American man, uh, and it's been mentioned before that it's suspect or inappropriate for me to make a story that works with ideas like uh, colonialism, slavery, uh, feminism, exploitation, uh, I don't know. I, I, I didn't have the critical apparatus to think about that sort of thing when I started, and it, it wasn't really a part of how stories were talked about in spaces that I was aware of. Um, but uh, as, as an American, that is, as a, a person from the global power that only exists because of the exploitation and enslavement of human beings, uh, it seems like it might be sort of conspicuous by its absence uh, if these sorts of ideas don't show up in a story like this. But I don't know. And uh, I don't think the odds are great that I am um, the person who has, has made the first story ever to, be, um, to, to have no questionable political content that its author is unaware of. <laughs> There, there, there's also the rich tradition of secondary world fantasy being a mythologized stand-in for race science. Um, this is a pretty big part of what we're doing with our elves and orcs and what have you. Uh, I don't know how deeply we're thinking about that or deconstructing it. Um, I don't know if I have thought about it enough either, but uh, we'll see how the thinking on that develops, I guess. <laughs> Then there were signs of trouble. Step one, watch the right. Keep that forward. There's a lot of ways that making this comic has changed over the course of it. I've said that uh, an awful lot of times. Um, maybe that's our theme here. <laughs> 
isn't uh isn't improvising kind of the raw material of any creative process no matter how much you think you have a handle on the big picture to execute on it you have to do a bunch of small picture work which on some level is composed of improvising in the moment um i think no matter your medium i think that's just kind of how it works So I've had a lot of these big ideas of uh, essentialized historical trajectories running throughout this book. Vatu herself is this character embodying a big historical collision. And in the abstract, I was always thinking of her as a kind of like outsider political genius. Like she has a bigger picture of the world than anyone around her by virtue of the way She's passed through it all. But as I'm writing her in the small scale, improvising, who is she? She's a pretty miserable, traumatized child. Her relationships to everyone around her are um, uh, brittle and, and strained. She's been closer to violence more constantly than anyone should be. Uh, I guess these aspects of her were always there in my thinking about the character but it's a lot clearer as i'm doing the 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 granular improv imp, improvisation writing uh and it's a lot clearer to me lately uh as i'm sort of you know trying to hold it all in my head this is a tension that seems important I'm trying to, at the same time, see her as an imagined person uh, and care about her and her suffering and what it means to her as if she's a real person, like sympathizing with her. Um, but at the same time, she's a character in a story that I'm writing. Uh, and like every character in, in a story, she's not a person, she's an object uh, in, a, in a big picture, uh, in a big fictional structure, like she's a, she's a part of a structure. These both should be clear at the, at the same time, uh, ideally, in the same way that I was talking about with setting. Uh, I try to take an invented setting seriously as a real believable place, and I'm and I'm on some level trying to get to that escapism feeling of like, oh, I could really go there. It really exists outside of the story. But I'm balancing that, or I am feeling at the same time as that, uh, this idea that it's an object um it's a it's a tool everything is subordinate to its use as a part of a story vatu is made of four books that will total uh 1200 something pages the first is the name and the mark the second is the sword and the sacrament the third is the tower and the shadow and the fourth is The River. I'm getting there. These books were printed over the course of the project using crowdfunding for pre-orders and with uh, essential help and support from Topatico. Kickstarter was a revelation to the independent comics world as a place for centralizing pre-order campaigns, and eventually it became an audience unto itself. A lot of people would look for things specifically on Kickstarter to back. Though most of my comics haven't had uh, easy, broad pop cultural appeal, so I was mostly just bringing my own audience over there to pre-order a book they already knew about. Kickstarter obviously is at that phase in the venture capital life cycle lately where it's attempting to sacrifice goodwill and functionality in order to guarantee uh, or suggest profit growth. Uh, it looks like they're buying into demonic technologies on the way to cashing out. So who knows what the future is right now for, uh, for that platform and, or maybe for self-published work like this in general. But I plan on getting the fourth book printed, same as these first three, uh, somehow. Um, I have an audience who has been interested in buying them, and that's, you know, 
That's a lot more important than Kickstarter. And I'm trying to think about how to get Vatu out there more. I've been able to work on it and have it in print and have it be most of my income for a while. But uh, I... But uh, I don't know. I'd like to figure out how to grow the audience more. Have people see it who aren't already aware of it. Um, I'm thinking about that a lot. Uh, is a publisher the answer? <laughs> uh, I, I think I'd make less money with a publisher than I do self-publishing. But maybe within that structure, there's an angle for, I don't know, there's more potential area for growth. Uh, uh, we'll see. I'm around 30, I think 30 pages ahead in the comic now than I was when I started writing and recording this video essay. I'm recording this part practically last. Uh, I'm multitasking a little less frantically than I'm used to, and I feel really in touch with it. Being uh, engaged and excited about a project seems like the most important resource and it's never constant. Sometimes it can be really flimsy. It can fluctuate a lot. But uh, with Vatu, I've always at least had it going in my head. At a certain point, there was so much of it, so much momentum, that I could get back into the headspace for it pretty easily. And if you build something complicated over a long enough time, you end up with a lot of connections, a lot of different ways of engaging with it, uh, reconnecting with it. Uh, well, it's a, it's wild to be um, around an ending to this thing. I've, uh, you know, I've finished stories before, but this is like not really that in the way that I would in the way that I thought it was when I started it um, this has become a kind of a space I'm always living in for the past 10 years of my life like uh, encompassing most of my 20s um, and uh, and sort of as much as I can manage changing along with me um, throughout that period and uh, and you know I don't know I'm not I'm not done yet I'm not to the a absolute end now and I there's a lot of like hoping I can stick the landing feelings there's a lot of you know it's a big complicated story and I want it to tie together in a way that's um, not satisfying but that uh, gets where I want it to get you know and a lot of that is where I thought it would get when I started. And a lot of that is not that at all. Uh, there's a particular, there's a lot of weird dynamics in making a story that takes this long. I think we have culturally this ideal that, that uh, the novel is kind of the the perfect type of story that is a, a story that's you know focused and psychological and uh, and built around more or less a single idea and where the the beginning perfectly prefigures the end and where it's uh, uh, tightly you know structured and um, you know you can write a novel in a year I don't know <laughs> people write novels fairly quickly so you can hold it all in your head and you can still be the same person when you finish it that you were when you started it. Uh, I don't think that that at all can be the case with, with comics if you're doing them as an individual um, because it takes so long and because so much of it is like uh, just drawing, just grunt work where you're not actually engaging with the big picture. In, in, in the same way. Um, it's exhausting to think about. 
It's exhausting to think about. Let me continue a little bit. I'm trying to. I'm. Th I'm. I'm thinking about that improvised versus planned out novel esque type of storytelling. Um, I know I said earlier in this uh, video that that I don't categorically prefer one over the other. But uh, since I wrote that, I think I really, I really have realized that I do prefer leaving a lot of open space, living in a story, uh, rolling with it, and um, sort of struggling always to make it look like it's, uh, it's planned <laughs> a little better than it is. Um, so that's, that's an aspect of what I'm doing next, I guess. I... Um, this is a very weird time to be trying to doing be trying to do esoteric self-published stuff. I don't know how sustainable it is, but uh, um, but I have given my life over to this stuff in a lot of ways, and I'm I'm uh, tremendously grateful for, uh, for 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 your interest in in any aspect of the work that I've done. Um, I, I appreciate that that so many people have read this stuff and and uh that so many of them have um have have indicated directly to me that it, it resonates with them in ways that I don't understand and in ways that I do uh, that's i like i want nothing more than that <laughs> and um you know, this is my this is my life. This is the sort of this is the sort of thinking and the sort of work that I that that, that I that I just want to hold on to as hard as I can. I I I'm I am committed, you know. And uh, I just it's it's inconceivable to me that so many people have 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 read this stuff and resonate with it um and thank i uh, thank you for thank you for reading thank you for for following along um i you know maybe i will continue doing things that appeal to you uh it's been very nice to know all of you through this work